This podcast is sponsored by Nobody. Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things could get totally radical. Now today, I will be welcoming back the lovely Derna Wild. You know, I had her back, I had her on the show back in September. Um, you know, she was in the cult classic Planet of the Dinosaurs. I'm having her back on the show today to talk about my car accident. She saw me post something about it several months ago, and um, she thought that that would be an interesting uh, topic for us, or actually I thought so. Well, she wanted to know about the accident. She wanted me to tell her, so I said, okay, I'll have you back on the show and we can talk about it. So I'm having her on the show today to talk about that and talk about whatever else is on our minds. And it's going to be pretty good. Derna is a lot of fun. And she's got a lot of spirit and empathy. I adore her. So yeah, here is my new interview with Derna Wild. Hey Derna. Hi Tommy, how are you? I'm great, how are you? I'm hanging in. Yeah, how's how are you doing in 2021? <laughs> Not as well as I would like, but uh, better than 20. 20, that's for sure. Yeah. How's, how's, how's everything with your health holding up? Uh, well, I've had a, a few challenges. Um, unfortunately, losing half a lung uh, definitely affects your body's ability to uh, maintain a balance between oxygen and carbon dioxide. So... Yeah. Uh, that that's the latest challenge I've faced. Yeah, oh, I'm so sorry that you have to go through that. Yeah, I just I just want this whole clusterfuck to end. You know, I I just I wanted I want to wake up and it all be a dream. <laughs> yeah, that would be nice. Unfortunately, that doesn't usually happen. So uh, we have to uh, on, on our best days do all we can to remain positive and uh, just have faith in ourselves to overcome. Yeah, it's just, huh, I miss doing things, you know. I miss concerts, miss going to the movies, fucking strangers. Yeah, don't we all? <laughs> I miss just being able to go to a restaurant and, yeah. and have a, a cocktail and a meal. Yeah, it's... It's insane. It really is. But, um, yeah, so a few months ago you saw me post um, about where I mentioned uh, my car accident. And, um, yes, I I talk about it all the time because it was just the most profound thing that ever happened to me. I wouldn't be doing this now if it didn't happen. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, so in 2013... My mom and I had, had just lost everything thanks to my stepdad, who was a dope addict. And we were homeless. We lived in our car, stayed in people's houses. And because I didn't have a job for the first six months, if people wanted to send me money, they had to do it through MoneyGram machines at CVS because I had no bank account for six months. And so my best friend dies in a car crash around Thanksgiving of 2014. and. Wow. I just fell into a much deeper depression than I already had, and I just didn't care about myself or what happened to myself or anything. And then on January 21st, 2015, it was a dark and ominous day, just like I, I knew something weird was on the horizon. I, I, di I did. I It's it really hard to pinpoint it, but it was pretty bad. And... Yeah, me and this guy, who I thought was my friend, I'd been hanging out with him for like four years. He had just, he had, he told me he had just gotten his license back when he didn't. And um, he, he he bought a, um, a, a new S SUV from a friend of his. And so uh, we drove up to San Francisco and... We went, we went to the strip club that we had gone to before, and he wanted to see if the stripper that he had dated was, was working. She wasn't there anymore, or actually she was, and then they got into an argument, so then we left, and then we went to another bar, and then everything blacked out from there. And all I remember is 
being in the middle of, of the road with my hand all cut up and sweating and my heart racing. Apparently what happened was he fell asleep at the wheel, I fell asleep in the passenger seat, and we ended up in the middle of the road, and we got out. But then a car collided with ours, and then the impact hit us, and I got the worst of the injuries. Wow. Yeah. Do you think that was because of uh, alcohol consumption? Alcohol definitely played a, a key, of course, you know, with uh, us ending up in the middle of the road. But I just. I, but I was, you were in the middle of the road stopped, is that correct? Yeah, we got out of the, the SUV, and mm -hmm. I, I guess we. I remember, yeah, we were trying to push the car to the side of the road and we couldn't do it. And then that's when I woke up in the hospital later. And I got the worst of the injuries. I had I had my leg broken in seven places. I had a heart attack, oh. fractured hand, my teeth broke, some of my teeth broke, um, crushed my sternum. I mean the works. I mean they said that I was gonna, I was going to be dead, and then I wasn't. I was in a coma for thirty days. Wow, that's traumatic, honey. Yeah, I woke up. Yep. Uh, I woke up on my mom's birthday on February 21st, and I was in the hospital till June 5th, which is the day before my birthday, and they told me I was never going to walk again, and of course I have, and the first... And we're grateful for that. Oh, of course. Of course, yeah. Yeah, but... I've had that uh, diagnosis as well. Mm -hmm. When I was 12, I was told I'd never walk again. But did you get hit by a car? Yep. I was, no, I was actually hit and dragged 50 feet by a streetcar mm. in San Francisco. I was the first person to survive being hit uh, by a streetcar. God. God, that's... Yep. I, uh, I ended up uh, 11 inches in front of the rear wheels. Oh, wow. Uh, it mangled my spine. Oh. But uh, I come from a family of chiropractors <laughs> on my mother's side, mm -hmm. and my mother was not willing to believe the doctors when they said I'd never walk again. So she came to my hospital room two or three times a day, and even though I could not wear clothing because I had third-degree abrasions, uh, over a good portion of my body, she made me get out of that bed and walk back and forth between the bathroom and my bed to keep my uh, bones and joints in motion mm -hmm. and uh, to pre prevent the paralysis. Because if I just stayed in bed and, and nursed the, the abrasions, I probably wouldn't have ever walked again. It took a long time. Yeah. Did you, did you miss but a lot? No, I ended up walking out of the hospital, so. Yeah. Did you, miss a, did you miss a lot of school? Um, I did not because it happened during the summer. Wow. Yeah, I missed a lot. But of, I, it took a long time uh, um, post-hospital uh, uh, recovery, and I couldn't wear normal clothes, mm -hmm. so I got teased a lot and bullied uh, in middle school, and uh, that turned me into a bit of an angry person. Oh. So I ended up getting into a lot of fights, and I got expelled from that middle school and had to go to another one. Mm -hmm. But then you grew into a, a gorgeous woman, and you got to be successful in life. Well, uh, I appreciate you thinking that. Unfortunately, I never did. So uh, I had no idea that I was um, really attractive. Uh, not until uh, um, probably my 50s mm -hmm. before I realized that uh, I wasn't too hard to look at. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, the first couple of weeks I was awake in ICU, I had these weird delusions from the anesthesia. You know, I imagined the nurses were plotting to kill me. I imagined I was watching a kung fu movie that wouldn't end. I mean, it was bizarre. I saw a lot of weird stuff during that time. I was watching... Did you have a head injury? Surprisingly, no, but others would argue I would because I want to be in show business. <laughs> <laughs> well, but the fact that you were in a coma for so long, uh, that would have played havoc with your mental state, I would imagine. Well, when I did take, well, they told me that when I did take, you know, that when, when I, when I got, when I got, when the impact hit me and I just, you know, went about 30 feet in the, into the air onto the ground. I mean, I was bleeding from my mouth, they said. Mm. Yeah, that, that has to do with, with, with something about that probably, but I didn't have any immediate head injury, although I, I did forget a lot of stuff and it took me about a year to get my brain back. Yeah. Yeah, I can relate. Oh, but here's well, a... I'm sorry you had to go through that experience. Mm-hmm. Whenever I bring up my accident to certain podcast guests, it makes them sort of uncomfortable. And surprisingly, the ones who had accidents themselves don't like talking about them, you know. And I bring it. I bring up their accident and my accident because you know I want to engage. You know, but I've I've come to learn that not everybody handles a, an accident the same way that I do. You know, um, but I think they should because you know living it is a gift and a privilege. You know, to be alive. But you know, I guess you know everyone you know takes their uh, their accident differently. Well, yeah, people people respond to trauma. Yeah. Uh, in unique ways, and no two people respond the same. Um, I've suffered enough traumas in my life to kind of be one of those that goes, eh, life happens. But not everybody can uh, adopt that attitude. And um, I think y your job as an interviewer is to uh, be sensitive right. to how other people perceive their own traumas versus how you perceive your trauma. Right. I know that for me, because of my philosophy and, and my experience in life, I'm able to go, eh. But I know most people are still living that trauma, mm -hmm. still dealing with it, still questioning, why me? Right. So I think that people like you and I have the onus to um, show and express uh, empathy and or sympathy right. for what others have endured, even though in our minds it may not seem as traumatic as some of the stuff we've gone through. Exactly. Yeah, that's everything that you just said I've, I've put together in my mind, you know, and I really wasn't trying to be insensitive, you know, but I guess they thought oh, that, no. of that not. yeah, I guess they thought that I was trying to be, you know, like in a few weeks, I'm going to be interviewing Bobby Rydell and he had an accident and he, he talks about it all the time. He even talks about it in his book. So I know there, you know, I won't have any trouble, but, um, yeah. Well, I think that his accident kind of uh, shortened his career, didn't it? It affected his his uh, singing ability or his his performance ability. Yeah. Or am I wrong about that? It could have. I mean, it happened a little bit later in life, but it could have. I don't know. I'll I'll find mm -hmm. out and stuff. I know that. Um, when um, Jan from Jan and Dean had his accident, yeah, he was never the same again. And I talked to Dean last year about that, and um, he had to, they had to do a, they they did some albums that ended up did not getting released for about forty years, where they had um, a, a Jan sound alike on them, 
Uh, for mm-hmm. for whatever reason, they didn't get released for 40 years, but I listened to them on YouTube, and they are beautiful. The music is just beautiful. And Dean, I think, took offense to the f- to the fact that I like those albums because because the real jam's not on them. And, you know, the music was beautiful, velvet, you know. Mm-hmm. And I can't change that, you know. Exactly. Yeah. But like I, I even had a couple supernatural experiences during my 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 whole my whole process. Um, you know, when I was in the coma, I remember with my eyes closed, I saw this real this weird grainy kind of flash, and I didn't know what that was. And then when I started the the podcast, I, I recorded the podcast differently when I first started. I would use a dictation recorder to pre-record it and then play it later and then people were like, nah, don't do that because we can barely hear it. So I stopped doing that and I started recording with my iPhone and I noticed when I was uh, recording on my iPhone that I saw this weird grainy flash and I think, you know, in hindsight, you know, when I saw it in the, saw the grainy flash in the coma, I thought that, you know, that was God's way of telling me what my future was going to be. Mm. Yeah. But everyone has. And that would uh, that would be unusual. <laughs> yeah, but everyone has their own beliefs uh, about ghosts and spirituality and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. But that's definitely what I saw. You know, growing growing up Catholic, you know, you you tend to believe that kind of stuff. <laughs> right. Well, you, your uh, uh, frame of reference is different. Mm-hmm. When you have organized religion in your. Uh, formative years your your thinking is formed by that right my 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 grandmother who was a very conservative italian you know she was very religious and you know she tried to put it in my head for years that that sex was evil and sex was bad and thank god by the time i i by the time she passed when i was 18 you know i saw that it wasn't so and so then I right. then I formed my own identity from that, and then I found out that she cheated on my grandfather all the time. <laughs> oh my goodness! <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, that's what happens. But um, yeah, I was curious, Derna. How's your memoir coming along? Oh, I'm not working on it at all right now. Oh, I'm, because break. I'm I'm trying to. Uh, First of all, uh, heal. Mm-hmm. Um, I was recently uh, in the hospital, so I'm healing from that. Uh, I'm also trying to take advantage of the fact that my sister is here from France mm-hmm. uh, to help me get packed up and um, getting all my uh, affairs in order so that I can uh, sell my house mm-hmm. and uh, uh move in transition to a, a low-income housing program. Uh, this, uh, unfortunately, uh, I don't have a pension, yeah. so I am um, forced to live on my Social Security. Yeah, is it, is it getting expensive at the place you're already at? Yeah, because they keep raising the rent on the uh, space. I live in a manufactured home park, uh, and... I didn't. I've never lived in one, so I didn't know anything about how they're operated. And mm-hmm. come to find out, they are operated without regard to uh, reality. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I mean, uh, I've been here three years. They've raised the rent every single year. Mm-hmm. Um, to well over a hundred dollar raise in three years oh. per month. My mom and I, we were in the same apartment in San Carlos for nine years before we lost everything. And mm-hmm. when we first got there, it was nine hundred a month for a one bedroom, right? And then um, when we left, it was thirteen fifty. That was like the last that we had to pay was thirteen fifty a month. Now it's it's about four thousand. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's like 
Can we get a clue? I mean, mm -hmm. it, it doesn't work for people. You can't keep, I mean, that was one thing, you know, uh, that I loved about San Francisco and New York was that they had a moratorium on rent increase and you could get, you could keep your uh, apartment for uh, a specified dollar amount, mm -hmm. which yes, no longer the case. But I guess in some areas uh, that still is happening. But yeah, rent control, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm in the middle of writing a book right now about my love of cult films, and I talk about my accident and and uh, different things in my life. And it's just a series of short essays about, you know, each film that I love that... These are all the films that define me, I feel. And I can remember where I was when I saw them, what year, and what they mean to me. You know, I talk about interviews that I've done with people about them and stuff. And I started that two months ago. And it's going pretty good. For good. You. Yeah, I got really emotional um, writing this one chapter um, back, uh, a couple weeks ago, but other than that, it's been great. I do it on the weekends um, after I don't have any interviews. I just I just uh, do a couple chapters uh, every weekend. Good for you. Yeah, I didn't think I didn't think I was I, I knew I was going to write a book. I didn't think I was going to do it so soon though, but. Um, I got motivated to do it um, around Christmas time, and yeah, hopefully in 2022 we'll see it. And well, I, I hope and wish you great success with that. Um, I I wish that I had the mental ability right now to get back to my writing, but I have so many other things on my plate that I just have to put it on the back burner for now. Mm -hmm. I think you will um, get back to it eventually, because last time we talked, you were so you sounded like you were passionate about it. Oh, I definitely am. Yeah. But I think that it's going to end up being a, a series of books, because so much uh, in my life uh, has value in sharing that I don't, think that I can uh, truly convey everything in one book. It would be a thousand page book. <laughs> so, <laughs> I think I'm going to have to do it in, in three separate uh, uh, storylines. Yeah. I mean, I have a couple of books in me, not just this one, but like I want to do a book about how, you know, about how I, I pretty much fell into a cult when I was an alcoholic. I was hanging out in, I was hanging out in bars and I was hanging out this one bar for a long time. That was pretty much like a cult in hindsight. You know, they told me, you know, who to associate with, you know, what to do. And, you know, I got thrown out of the circle, so to speak, you know, I mean, it, it's like a whole book to write about. I'm definitely going to do that at some point, but right now I'm not ready because I need to get my passion out first, you know, before Absolutely. I go, before I go really dark, you know? <laughs> yeah. I can relate. Yeah. So sh shifting gears a little bit, I wanted to ask you, Durda, you know, it's, it's funny. I, you know, I interview a lot of older actresses and stuff, you know, and we talk about the sexual revolution of the 60s, you know, and what a crazy time it was, you know. Um, what was it like for you growing up during that time? Oh, well, <laughs> it was pretty uh, much free love, uh, free love and LSD. I mean, that's what the 60s and early 70s was really about. Mm -hmm. Um peace, love, and rock and roll. Um, and, of course, you know, everybody was a deadhead, and uh, we had things like Fillmore West, uh, and um, just a lot of up-and-coming uh, bands. Jimi Hendrix was new to the scene. Yep. Arlo Santana, uh, you know, and it goes on and on, and 
and music was a huge part of it. And of course, part of music was groupies. Oh, yes. So there was a lot of that uh, going on, and uh, Bill Graham uh, had the Fillmore, and uh, he put on some incredible uh, concerts, and I was at most of them. <laughs> <laughs> Even though I was only, you know, 14, 15, I looked much older, I dressed much older, so nobody questioned uh, my age, fortunately. So I, I got to go to all these incredible uh, venues and hear uh, Janis Joplin and uh, Jefferson Airplane and uh, people like that. And, and, you know, sex was everywhere. Mm -hmm. Sex was uh, pretty much everywhere. You didn't even necessarily need to know anybody's name. Yeah, that's what I miss. <laughs> it, it, it just let's get high and go screw. Right. Yep, that, that's what the 60s was really like. And um, it was a wild time of exploration on many fronts, including spiritual uh, growth and, and investigation. Yeah, I, I've talked to a lot of people who were there during that time. You know, I talked to this this filmmaker, he's Australian. He went to Stanford um, in the early 60s, and his uh, he rented a room uh, with uh, the parents of um, one of the guys from uh, New Riders of the Purple Sage. And mm -hmm. Jerry Garcia um, was, like, living in the same neighborhood, and so he got to hang out with him. And uh, they, they went up to San Francisco and they, they did acid with Ken Kesey, you know, who wrote One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I thought that was pretty damn funny, you know. Yeah, it was just wild. And yep, Well, I grew up uh, on Haight-Ashbury. Mm -hmm. So I was right in the thick of it. Yeah, oh my God. With, uh, with Osley, who invented the best pharmaceutical LSD right. um, and uh, Timothy Leary who was Osley's best friend and uh, yeah there was a lot of uh, a lot of opportunity for all kinds of uh, uh, partying and growth yeah I went to the hate uh, a couple of months after I got out of the hospital uh, for a festival. I, God, I cannot believe how ghetto it was over there now. We went to a McDonald's, and some black girl pushed me, and I was so damn fragile. I was walking on two canes at that point. Oh, my God, and I was so mad. I wanted to freaking just, oh, God, create a scene that she just pushed me out of the way like that. Oh, I'm sorry you had to go through that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Oh my God. Did uh, so? Uh, did did your mother uh, let you date boys right away? Um, I was kind of the black sheep in my family, so they didn't really have a voice in what I did. Mm hmm. I kind of did what I wanted, and yeah. they couldn't reel me in. <laughs> Did you get did you get on the pill right away? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I talked I talked to this one actress from Canada who told me that um, her mother insisted on it because um, her her mother she she took she took after her mother in in being um, you know promiscuous and stuff so she insisted that her daughter go on it you know this was in like sixty seven or something. Well, in my case. Uh... When I was uh, 13, I had been out uh, shooting pool with my cousins. Right. And uh, when we were done, I went outside to smoke a cigarette. And I got abducted by two guys uh, in a Corvette, of all things. Mm -hmm. And um, I was still a virgin mm -hmm. and was... Uh, raped and beaten and uh, that was my introduction to sex 
I'm so sorry, Durna. Sorry you had to go through that. Yeah, well, shit happens. <laughs> and, uh, unfortunately, uh, that would not be the last time. But, uh, you go through shit in life, and either you learn from it, or you just go through it. And I have tried to always learn from every experience. Mm -hmm. Did you did you have any gay friends back then who were in the closet? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've I've talked to actresses who were like doing theater in New York back in the early '60s, and uh, they had a lot of gay friends who were in the closet. And and funny enough. You know, back in those days, women didn't brag about their sex lives, right? But the the gay men, they did all the time. They would just tell you the dirtiest stories. <laughs> well, and and that was the era of Studio Fifty Four. Of course, which was predominantly gay, anyway. Mm hmm. Did you go there? Uh, no, that was in New York. I did not spend any time on the East Coast. No. Oh. <laughs> only only read about it later, <laughs> right? Yeah. I had friends later on who had been there for that, but mm -hmm. not me. Yeah, this was this one actress I talked to. One time her and a gay friend, they were going to go uh, to, to go see a show or something like that, and he was over a half an hour late, and he said that... Um, uh, while he while he was on his way to her apartment, he saw he saw a good looking uh, other gay guy who had a dog, and so he started like talking to the guy about his dog, and then pretty soon he, uh, the two of them were in his apartment having a quickie, and the, that's why he was late. <laughs> Funny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Yeah, in those in, yeah in those days, yeah, like you know, w women didn't brag about the sex they had. You know, I mean, they'd go to like you know the salon to to get their hair done or something, and they would say something like, "Oh, last night he sucked my big toe," and then that's the extent of the bragging. <laughs> you know, times have changed. Yes, they have. <laughs> Oh my God, though! But that's so that's so terrible that you had to endure all of that. Did you did you ever go through therapy? Oh yes. Mm hmm. Oh yes. Uh, a few times. Yeah. Uh, again, learned uh, from my circumstances, and uh, that. Uh, is pretty much uh, what I've done with everything. Yeah, I went to therapy. But I don't talk about the details of that. Oh, absolutely. It's still very private. Yeah. I went, I went through therapy for a brief time um, after my grandmother died. All the guy, the guy, all, all he told me was, you just need to get out more, make some friends, you know, you know, get your mind off it. You know, eventually I did. It took. You a didn't have a good therapist. No, I didn't. <laughs> but eventually I did, though. You know, it was it was a it was a while before I started drinking, but I eventually I did get out, and I was I was better by then. Well, that's good, Tommy, and I'm glad that uh, you know you're still out there uh, putting it together and trying to understand. Uh, why things are the way they are and expressing yourself. So kudos to you. Thank you so much. I have a, I have a couple jokes for you. <laughs> okay. You know the difference between um, a golf ball and a G-spot? I'm sure you'll tell me. A man rather spend 20 minutes looking for a golf ball. <laughs> it's probably true it is <laughs> you know what the elephant said to the naked man I have no clue man how can you breathe through that thing <laughs> <laughs> I like that one yeah well, Derna, I thank you so much for coming back on today and hearing me, you know, tell my accident story. And uh, I hope, you know, things get better for you. I pray for you all the time. 
I appreciate that, Tommy, and likewise. And uh, it was my pleasure, and I hope that things continue to go well for you and uh, only get better and better. Wonderful. Well, I will see you on Facebook. All right, dear. Take care now. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it. Derna Wild. Ain't she a sweetheart? Ah, oh, I love her. Such a wonderful lady. And she's a survivor, like the rest of us. She is a very big survivor. Welp, until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, There's no shame in living in the past, because the present sucks. Later, dudes!